that's some sweet ass coffee. Welcome back to Agostino's English Show, episode number 128, with me, your host, Agostino. How you doing? What's up, motherfuckers? It's your boy, Agostino, man. I'm back in the hot seat, talking all this hot mess on this non-hot day, wearing this hot-ass jumper. Um, I won't say, well, I won't say it's hot. I say it makes you hot. I say um, this jumper that I'm wearing, this hoodie, is sort of like an alpaca type thing that I got from Mexico, which is nice. It's actually made in Mexico too, which is really crazy. Because when you go to these places, these um, exotic lands, and you buy um, merch or you buy souvenirs, it sometimes can be a bit of a bummer when you look at the bottom of it. You see it's made in China or Vietnam. You're like, oh, man, come on, guys. Right? You can't even make your own beads, right? It's fucking annoying, right? But this jumper is actually made in um this aztec you sort of i don't know what what they call these things but do you, do you know those dudes what those dudes use those dudes wear when they're playing hacky sack in the park or when they're playing bongos on the side of the street this is the kind of jumper i'd imagine them to wear or it's the kind of jumper i'd imagine uh, like an r&b singer to wear someone very lavered uh like a miguel right covered in vaseline you know um making really high-pitched noises uh-huh well, that sort of shit. This is what I imagine someone they're wearing. So, if you're playing hacky sack with a bunch of bros who don't uh, shower or use um, deodorant, or you're singing really high pitch R and B songs uh, covered in baby oil. Either way, this jumper's flames, bro. Flames. Um, I'm trying to also conserve energy in this household, you know, because you know we use electric heating, and you have to put a key fob in the meter. So I'm trying not to waste too much power. I remember that being a big thing back when I was used to live back at home with my mum. You know, she used to always complain and whine and bitch about the heating. And I never used to get it. I'm like, mum, chill the fuck out, man. It's only heating. But when you live on your own <laughs> and, you're, and, you're, and, you're, and it's coming up to Christmas and you want to conserve heat and you also want to make sure you have money in your pocket, you start to worry about the fucking electricity. You start turning off lights in certain places. You start turning off, flicking off the switches. I'd never imagine I'd be that person, honestly. I used to take the piss out of my mum so much of those kind of things. Like, come on, man. It's such a big deal, mum. Relax, mum. Chill out, mother. Take it easy, yo. Put your feet up. And I look at me, turning off every light in every room like an old lady. And wearing jumpers instead of turning on the heater. Oh, Jesus Christ. But yeah, what can you do? Episode number 128 of the Exynos Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino. What's going on? What's happening? Today's a bit of a different show because I haven't come back from exercising. I'm going to go exercising after the show. So um, usually I like to exercise before. I feel like, you know, the exercise before gives me an in, um, a little energy bolt that I hope is uh, somehow uh, gets relayed back into this podcast. But I'm going to change things up slightly, ever so slightly, and work out after I finished, which is weird and different. But, you know, I'm just going to go with the flow. Yes, I had a break, had a bit of a break day to kind of make sure my legs recovered, um, which I'm finding is being quite helpful during the week. I used to do five days in a row. So I do Monday to Friday and then have the weekend off. But now I try and do six days and have the one day off in a week. So the Sunday will be a bit of a, it won't be as hard as the rest of the week, but I'll still work out. I might go um, to the gym and do some mo- mobility exercises because I follow Mobility World. So check that out too, mobilityworld.com. You can get, um, I think, a, a subscription I pay is like $8 a month. And um, you get to have a, basically they upload workouts every single day. Not workouts, but the kind of mobility exercises for you to kind of make sure you have the um the correct range of motion in all your vital limbs and it's very handy to use especially for uh post workout for pre and post and just for generally if you want to make sure that you know your hinges and your hip are working the way they're meant to be working at the moment i'm working on making sure i can get into a full squat without having to go into my toes it's been a bit difficult but i'm slowly slowly but surely getting there um and yeah so little things like that like shoulder impingements due to like overhead presses or bench presses i highly recommend you use um mobility work so usually my sundays are a bit more of a mobility work um based day but i still try and get some sort of exercise in but i found i found in general having one day break in the middle of the week has really helped me recover better than having two days back to back in a weekend I sometimes can get a little bit crazy. I sometimes let myself um, get a little bit too relaxed. And then by the time Monday Monday comes around, I'm tired and I'll just start working out on Tuesday. So that means I've had a three-day break. So I prefer to have uh, two days, Monday, Tuesday, straight off the bat, week, uh, a little break in between on a Wednesday, and then get back on the horse on Thursday and then continue on to the rest of the week. So that's what I'm going to do this week. And hopefully it works out as intended. Um, apart from that, it's been a pretty stable week. Um, I spent most of my day yesterday uh, reading. 
I did a mix that I prepared. I'm going to actually um, uh, preview or post a little snippet at the end of this podcast. If you're listening to this via the audio. If you listen, if you watch this on YouTube and you see me pick my nose, uh, you'll be able to see the link for the mix I recorded below in the description of the, of the of this video. So make sure you check that out. It's a uh, it's more of a techno mix. The mix I posted um, previously was what I generally play in the pubs that I play in and bars I play. It's a little bit more, you know, general. It appeals to most people. But the link I was going to post um, at the bottom of this video or at the end of the podcast listed via audio is mostly a techno mix of stuff that I kind of would like to play in a nightclub if I was um, booked to one of these big establishments. Some stuff is new, stuff is old, but you can check it out. I'll have it at the end of the podcast. So listen on deep. But yeah, yesterday was a big day, isn't it, right? So United played Arsenal, big day, game ended 2-2. The less said about the game, the better, but, you know, as a United fan, you can't, well, yeah, less said about the game, the better, but overall, you kind of want this Mourinho thing to be over, don't you? You just want it to be done. I want it to be done. I'm so over it. I'm so fucking over it. I just want him to be out um, and for us to move on, but these things don't, you know, they don't they don't change as quickly as you hope they would change. But you know, fingers crossed that. Um, but it's it's weird for us to be in because you kind of want him to be out of a job, but you don't want United to suffer, um, which is quite idiotic, really, because it's the only way he's gonna get fired from his job is if he doesn't if the team stops stops performing. But I think the team is getting lambasted so much in the press by ex players by fans, by pundits, by journalists, that I think a lot of them, which is good to see, a lot of them have a lot of professional pride and they don't want to be embarrassed in public, right? Because I saw, because it's no coincidence that, you know, May Night v Arsenal is probably one of the most um, uh, memorable, it's probably one of the most iconic Premier League games there is, right? Uh, rivalries outside of a local derby, right? Um, there's a lot of, you know, going back from, going back to the 80s, there's been some memorable games between those two sides. So it's no coincidence that our players decided to wake up on this occasion, right? They all came out of the blocks firing, people closing down, Rashford, Martial, Lingard, uh, leading the chase with closing down players, and Arsenal, which is probably a little bit easier to do with Arsenal because they play out from the back uh, most of the time. So you got to see... Uh, you got to see our players kind of, you know, show a bit more determination and fight. But as somebody mentioned in another forum I was reading yesterday, it's quite sad times to be a United fan when you're praising the effort and fight that the play the shows are showing. That the show that the players are displaying. That's what we're praising. We're like, Oh my god, I can't believe our players closed people down and showed hunger and determination. It's like that should be standard, isn't it? You're playing for Manchester fucking United. I mean that should be a standard occurrence. You should be. Uh, show determination and fight because if you don't then you're you're out of the squad you know what i mean uh, someone else can come in and take your place but you know we've fallen so far behind the pack um and we're so low in confidence that any sort of any sort of glimmer of hope the fans are going to hold on to like you know um the, the fans are just going to hold on to it regardless so yeah yes the last night's game when less said about it the better i'm in two minds whether or not i should be hoping that we lose so Mourinho gets fired or i should be hoping that we are so bad that he has the dignity enough to walk. But he's not going to do that, is he? It's not in his interest to walk because, you know, you got to look after number one. If he walks, he won't get as much money as he would do if he gets fired. So, effectively, he can't do that much. And, you know, I'm sure somewhere in the crevices of his mind, he generally believes that he shouldn't be fired, right? He generally believes that he's doing a good enough job, which is weird, isn't it? That's the thing I've learned reading books and um, trying to be a little bit more... Um, trying to understand human nature a little bit more right uh, i've kind of gleaned some insights uh through books i've read and most recently through this um book that i'm listening to an audio book by robert green called uh, laws of nature and if you that robert green name uh rings true then then you would know that he was the guy that wrote the 48 laws of power one of the most um, influential books within the hip-hop community. Um, it has been said, and you think he wrote a follow-up with uh, 50 Cent called 50 Laws of Power too, which I didn't read, which was kind of shit. And he's got Mastery too, which I've got here at the back. Mastery, which is an amazing book too. I recommend you check that out. That kind of um, details or kind of pulls back the curtain on some really influential people in history and sort of like looks at how they've achieved their level of mastery and kind of... It kind of um, strips away the mysticism around it, right? It's not some sort of like ephemeral gift. It's usually just, um, it's usually uh, a consequence of com uh, of consistent hard work, really. Um, a methodology, a consistent hard, consistent hard work that's like, you know, unbeknown to anyone else. Right? I mean, regular humans can't put in that kind of level of work. You know how I said, 
I take off the Tuesday to have a break in between. It's that kind of level of commitment where you don't take off the Tuesday. You don't take off the Wednesday, the Thursday, the Friday, the Saturday, the Sunday, the Monday, or the Tuesday. You just keep going consistently. Every single day you turn up, even when your muscles are aching. So um, that's what that book details. And uh, laws, of, um, laws of Human, uh, Laws of Nature, sorry, that I'm reading at the moment. Um, it's kind of, I'm only, um, I think I'm only the first couple of chapters through on this book. Actually, see if I can get it up here. Even though my screen's fucking smashed, he smashed the lay, 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 lay. You can see here on my audio book thing on i on the iPhone. Can you see that? Yep, it's coming up there. There we go. Laws of Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. Right. I'm only I'm only a few. I'm only a couple of chapters into that right now at the moment. But I recommend you check it out. I think it's available on paperback. I'm gonna get it actually on paperback soon. I want to get through the first couple of chapters and get a feel of the book, and then I'm gonna get a paperback as well. Um, usually I don't really I don't buy double. I don't buy um. I don't I don't listen to an audiobook and buy the physical book, but I think this book is gonna there's gonna be so many bits in it I wanna quote, so many things I wanna read right on the margins that I kinda wanna listen to it. I kinda wanna get the physical copy. Which goes to show that as great I don't know what people do with Kindles, because that's why I don't really like Kindles. I don't I, I obviously I prefer the the tactile nature of a physical book, right? But like, you know, grabbing for instance, like, you know, I've got this the Gulag Archipelago, which I've been smashing out and reading and I've just about finished it. About think of where where am I in the Gulag Archipelago? I'm about here, so I've got about this much left of the Gulag Archipelago to finish, right? Which is pretty decent considering the density of this book. But I love highlighting bits. I love just, you know, uh putting dog ears on on places that I think are of, of interest. And I'm not sure how you do the same thing or writing in the margins sometimes. I'm not sure how you do the same thing um, with a Kindle. I'm assuming they've got some sort of note section on the Kindle, right? That you can write on and make some edits and stuff and things you're thinking about. But I much prefer just like using, even sometimes on books, they have the last couple of pages are like blank. So you can kind of write on it. Not on this, obviously. Not the girl, probably go, most of it's taken up with a bibliography and afterwards and stuff. But there are books that does exist with something like that. But yeah, um, Laws of Human Nature um does go to it the first couple of chapters are have already kind of ring true to me and kind of you know it, um made some things clear and obviously um reading stuff like the extreme ownership by jocko willink as well has been a big big one especially off the back of this whole like company going insolvent um i think i've uh i've kind of looked at i've kind of tried to take myself away from it trying to pull myself away from it and not be as emotional in the situation and not be bummed out or not think any sort of negative thoughts and really analyze it for what it is and I think even from the very beginning I think I've spoken to a few people about this I had my doubts I kind of knew something wasn't kosher from the very on beginning even before I signed my contract I kind of knew that was happening and um, I think sometimes in life I think we all kind of have that feeling we all have that kind of inkling but sometimes when things do hit when shit does hit the fan I think it's easier to just say, you know what, it's their fault. It's uh, because he or she did that. That's why I'm in a situation where, whereas kind of, you know, maybe pointing the finger back at yourself and saying, what could you have done better? Or could you have taken more time to make a decision? Could you have been a little bit more forthright? Could you have maybe spoken up a bit sooner? Um, is a little bit harder because then the onus falls on you, right? Um, of course, not everything is going to be your fault, but I think having that kind of POV or having that kind of frame of mind that most things are your fault and that you can affect more things than you than you cannot affect, I think it's the best way to deal with these kind of things and to also kind of dust yourself off and go again. Because if I'm if I'm gonna be like, woe is me he or she did this, they don't want me to win sort of thing. How am I expected to get get back up on the saddle and try again? It's going to take really long because I because then I have to grieve over this lost opportunity. But when I'm, I'm accepting that it's my fault and I know myself and I know that I can change myself and I can, you know, at a drop of a hat, then I'm just going to get on with it. But when it's somebody else, how long am I going to, how long is it going to take me to get over the person, the situation? when it occurred, who else was complicit, blah, 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 blah. But it just keeps going on and on and on. But when you only got yourself to blame, it's only, it's only one person. So um, I think in that respect, I probably do have myself to blame in that regard. I probably jumped ship from my old place a little bit too soon. 
I think I was, I think I just, you know, we just get fed up at one place. I was just fed up. And I think I've always had this, dick, dick, um, I've always had, um, I've always, I've always maintained that people moan too much in jobs. I think in my own personal opinion, if I think if you've, if you've known anyone that's worked full time, I think the, the general thesis or the general basis of working full time is that you have something to moan about anyway right that's what makes it probably fun for some people right going to the pub and having a moan about your boss or your colleague or this order or that thing right it's probably part of the fun but i just hate i hate complainers i've always i always have i hate gossipers i hate whingers just gets on my nerves it kind of just like everything everything it like it makes my hair stand on end i can't i can't i just can't do it so whenever I hear people moaning about work, it's even more frustrating because work is one of those things or jobs are one of those things that are, that are just 10 a penny, right? You could go anywhere and just get another job or you could figure out and be a grown up that most jobs are going to suck. You're not going to like everyone and that you have to kind of um, weigh up the good and the bad, the pros and the cons. And most of the times the jobs aren't as bad as you think they are. But I think I was in a point at my life where I was starting to get serious on the podcast. I was starting to get booked quite regularly with DJing. I was starting to kind of do my movements, right? And then I was working in this kind of dead-end monkey wrench job, right? That a monkey could do, could do. And it was, I think the contrast was just too much for me to deal with. Like, I was just like, fuck. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was doing such a monotonous task that was like getting on my nerves. And there was so much micromanaging with that fucking job that it kind of really, that's the thing that pissed me off about it, was that I probably wasn't that good at it anyway, to be honest, if I'm, if I'm going to put my hands up on it. I probably wasn't that good at it. I wasn't that um, will. I wasn't, I wasn't um, willing to lower my ego enough to be allowed to be better at it, right? I just, I just didn't care enough. I just thought I was better than a job, which I probably am not. Um, so my ego got in the way. Um, I also got frustrated because of the job was a constant reminder of just how far away I was from where I wanted to get to, right? Because it's such a, because I think my thinking before going into that job was that it was entry level. I could just do it and go home. I didn't have to stay any longer because, you know, I've worked in jobs where I've had a fancy title. I've been paid really well, but I've had to stay an extra hour. I've had to come in an extra, uh, an hour earlier. I've had to go on a business trip to you know, the first couple of business trips you go on, the first couple of fashion week things you go to, they're fun, right? Because you've never been before. Oh my God, fashion week. Um, They get paid for my Uber. They're paying for my lunch. Duh, 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 duh. It's fun. But then afterwards, just turns, but then after the first three or four, it just turns, it just turns into work and the fun, um, the, the fun uh, disappears, which is sad, right? Because, you know, you've grown up in this industry, you've grown up on this scene, uh, wanting to be involved. You finally get involved, but because you're working in a job, and it's not, um, you're not there as an influencer, you're not there as a cultural critic, you're not there as a personality, you're not there as um, someone of, inf or whatever, right, someone of notoriety, you're just there as a someone working at a job, it kind of loses, its, the fun goes, the fun vanishes, and you just turn into another job, which is annoying. Um, so I've had those jobs, but they require a lot of you. They require you to kind of sacrifice a lot of your free time. And that's something that I've never, ever, ever been comfortable with doing, right? I would love. I, I think I appreciate having a job. I think it's a great thing. But I think overall, in general, I have far better, I have far bigger ambitions for my life. I kind of want to be self-sustain, so, so sustainable. I kind of want to be able to make money, you know, through this so from the sweat of my brow and through the skin on my own hands, right? I want to kind of get dirty and do my own thing. But I'm also appreciative that sometimes if you're not capable of doing that, then you have to exchange your time in order for money, in order to kind of like keep a roof of your head and to keep your belly full. No problem with that. But I think um, this job was just, the job I had previously was just so low of an entry level, so low in terms of like what it required that I think it made me think too much. I was questioning my life decision, all that sort of malarkey. I just got fed up and just thought, you know what, fuck, I'm going to quit. So I quit, jumped it, probably rushed too, probably rushed too quickly into another job, and then now we're in position where we're in now. The new job that I moved into, the company declared bankruptcy, and now we're in position where we're in now. So it's like, even though there were, even though you could you could paint it as if saying that no, actually no, you were ambitious, you went for something, you weren't um comfortable, you weren't happy with just being comfortable in the position that you were in before because you know effectively I could have done the job I was doing previously for another four to five years and no one would have blinked an eyelid, right? I could just that, could continue doing what I was doing, right? Just kept my head above water. Uh, don't ex don't stretch yourself too far, too thin. I didn't get involved in any managerial stuff. I didn't get involved in any training. I didn't get involved in any extracurricular work. I just went in and went out. Um, I could have easily continued doing that, but I think 
life is too short and a bit of my soul would have died, I think, staying in that position. Even though the main thing about that job that was amazing was the people that I worked with, they were the best, right? The best colleagues a person could ever ask for. Pro like really, really, really amazing. Um, So much, you know, you only work somewhere and everyone that everyone you work with is generally friends and they go on a holiday together. That's how fucking freaky it was. That doesn't happen usually in quite a lot of workplaces. You don't usually get um a workplace where people go on holiday together. That's not a thing. Maybe they might go out together, right? They might go on lunch together. But sometimes even lunch buddies, when the day's over, they will split and go their own way, right? No one wants to talk to each other anymore because they've had enough of communication. So imagine going on a holiday with people you work with. That's That shows that the company culture there was fucking amazing. Or, you know, or that some teams were just very close, right? Some teams probably not as much as others. But I think staying there with my soul, but part of my soul would have died. I also think it was a wake up call in terms of me realizing just how much I don't want to be working anymore because, you know, effectively, even if I do get a fancy title again and I do get paid well, it's still going to be the same shit. It's still working for somebody else. It's still not me doing my own thing. So it's not as if I'm looking for a, an employment utopia, right? That doesn't exist, right? Um, what does exist is being, um, is having a level of appreciation for what you do have, right? I don't think occupation in Tokyo exists, but there is that level of appreciation of like, hey man, you got a job, man. You're not on the street panhandling and begging motherfuckers for money or asking your friends to, you know, lend you ten pounds. You're actually being able to, you know, um, sustain yourself uh, through your own hard work, right? And if, as long as you turn up, as long as you do a good job, as long as you're a good colleague, as long as you're someone's willing to learn, you're gonna work your way up easy. Surely, but surely, but surely. Yes, a part of your soul may die. Yes, there'll be parts of the day that will be boring, or the week, or the month, right? Where you're questioning your life decisions. Cool. But I think what you should do if you're in those kind of positions and you're in those jobs that you hate or you despise as um is you should give yourself a treat you should treat yourself every payday to something whether it's an experience whether it's a material possession um whatever it may be you should give yourself a treat to make everything worth it so don't do that thing that people do where they don't take any holiday they don't buy themselves anything any night anything anything nice they don't go on a on a date with their spouse they don't buy themselves a pair of new trainers they don't go on a splurge and just, you know, I don't know, buy fucking stupid, um, expensive stationery. They don't do all that stuff and then they complain. No, no, no. Do that stuff, right? Like, treat yourself every month when you get paid, right? And then that will make the job worthwhile. You have at least something to look forward to. It's sort of like when people have the Friday to look forward to. You know, people are like, oh, I'll come here for the weekend. It's a bit sad, right? And it makes, it makes me cry inside knowing that there's adults out there that are looking forward to the weekend, right? You know, to kind of really enjoy their lives. That's really, really sad to hear. But I get it. I get it. I get it. When you're working a job you don't want to be working at because you have responsibilities and because you're a grown up, you just have to sometimes do stuff you don't want to do in order to kind of do the stuff that you want to do. But I think in order to make it worthwhile, to balance things out, treat yourself. Get yourself something nice every single month. And honestly, it will make life much worth. It will make the job much worth. It make the it will make the job worth having, right? It will make the job worth having. And also on top of that, take a hol take holidays, man. You don't have to go anywhere. Have a do a staycation. I've done loads of those things. Like I think um your holiday in employment is calculated by the month. I think you get like two and a half days each month. If that's true, I think so. Two and a half days each month, which equals about twenty five, twenty eight, right? If that's true if that's tr if that rings true for your place of work then take then take those two days off a month just do that or every other month take four days off right why not take the time off you don't need to go anywhere just take the time off to relax and chill out honestly you'll thank yourself later you don't need to go on a two-week vacation if you don't want to go on next some people don't like those kind of things some people don't like to be alone with their thoughts for too long i understand that i get it completely just take two days off every month honestly and and buy yourself something something nice you you it'll make the job much much worth having i i, I, I can honestly uh, um rick i can't recommend that any more highly so yeah um i think that's what again just from this just from reading the first couple of chapters of um laws of human nature laws of nature laws of human nature i've already got i've already gleaned that much about myself anyway that i probably was aware of the situation beforehand and i probably just ignored the signs because i was just so desperate to get the situation i was in previously which again you know i can't blame anybody else but, but myself um so that is the kind of position that i'm at at the moment so yeah that's what that's why books are amazing right isn't it because it's like the what how much is that audio book let's say 19 pounds and i've already gained that much value out of reading two chapters that's already like you know it's already it's already um repaid its value. It's already repaid its retail. It's already repaid itself like ten times over. Like you know what I mean? Like 
that's the amazing things about books. But yeah, so that's where I've been. That's where my mind's kind of been at the moment. Just accepting that, you know, maybe it was my fault more so than it was the employer. Yes, the employers, you know, the employer fucked up by, you know, allowing their business to get to a position where they have to declare bankruptcy. I understand that. But, you know, sometimes these things don't happen overnight. You know what I mean? They're not some things that, oh my God, suddenly now you're bankrupt. You know, things, things are... You, you, um, things are fairly obvious if you just open your eyes. You know what I mean? If you just look really carefully and you don't ignore the, the signs, you can see what's really going on. Um, and even someone like myself, who for the most part, when I work in place, I always have my headphones on. I'm always listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video and another tab. I never, I'm never usually partaking in the office gossip, which has been my, which has been to my detriment. I have to be honest. Um, even though I don't like gossiping, I think being aware of what's happening around you, right, is just it's quite handy. <laughs> um, when you've always got your headphones in seven hours of the day um it's not necessarily the best thing and people don't necessarily think you're an ally as well that's a weird thing i realized too when you have your headphones in too often people sometimes can think you're a bit of a teacher's pet right that you're just there you're just trying to you're you're overly trying to put out signals that you're not partaking in the in the gossip and everyone also with kind of, is gonna you know they're kind of they're gonna be a bit like you know put out by you so i recommend that if you are that kind of person um, like me, take out your headphones from time to time, engage in some conversation, some idle chit chat, ask about your colleague's boyfriend or girlfriend, or about that thing they bought on Cyber Monday, whatever it may be, just, you know, exchange some chit chat. And I think that will go a long way in ensuring that you don't miss anything that's happening within office politics. But it does take up a lot of your time, doesn't it? All this work shit. That's why I'm saying it's just so annoying. Just can't wait to get myself out of it. it occupies too much of your brain power to be involved with these people. It's just not normal, is it, really? To be in these enclosed environments with strangers eight hours of the day. You probably see them more than you see your family, right? You see your loved ones. It's fucking nuts. And you don't know them at all. You don't know them. That's the thing about work work, work people is weird. You only know what you see at work. And what you see at work is, pff, what is that even? Do you know what I mean? It's like, an, it's like everyone's got a little avatar, like their, their work avatar. It's like when a, an investor comes in and they, and they shake everyone's hand. Everyone's like, oh, hey, please, please give us money so we don't go bankrupt. <laughs> Oh, fucking hell what can you do what can you fucking do anyway to lighten the mood a little bit because i got a little bit deep there talking about my woes uh i saw this and i thought this was fucking funny let me load this bad boy up bish bash bosh get that screen on what do you think of this hey 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 Suck my dick, bitch. Let me talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is so scared, so. Let me talk to you. Suck my dick, bitch. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, good old spit through the window. Everyone loves a bit of that, don't they? I don't, I don't know what the fuck that's about. Don't ask me, honestly. Do not ask me what the hell that's about. I don't know what's about there, but I thought that was funny. It's just weird. Guys love crazy fucking girls, don't they? Why is it? Is it because they're meant to be better in bed? Is it because they're just fucking nuts and, it, it, you know, it gives you a bit of a jolt during the day, you know? You know, this mundanity of life, you know, everyone's like, please, excuse me, thank you, ha ha, hee hee. Maybe it's having someone uh, mentally unhinged lying next to you kind of just, you know, gives you a bit of a, uh, gives you a bit of a rush. I don't know what it is, but guys love crazy girls, isn't it? And this girl is fucking nuts. If you didn't see the video, she's like, let me talk to you, come on. You know, like, you know, the boyfriend's, obviously, I'm assuming, or the guy of interest is in the car. And then suddenly she snaps and she's like, what's up, bitch, fuck you. It's like, what the hell? It's like literally like Jekyll and Hyde. You don't know what to make of that. I don't know what's happening there. I don't know what's going on. Um, again, the recording of people when they're angry is just, just it never, it's never a good idea, is it? Recording somebody when they're going through a bit of a mental breakdown. I just don't know what the, I don't know what the, um, um, what the purpose of that is. Is that, is it purely recon? You want to gather intelligence and information. So if they decide to take it to court, you have evidence to show that this girl is fucking nuts. Is it a way of um, shaming them. I don't know what it is, but it definitely doesn't have the effect that they want it. It doesn't have the intended effect that they want. It has un it has unforeseen circumstances or consequences. I think so. 
just an automatic like um, red light, isn't it? When someone pulls out a phone, you just want to suddenly turn up. No one sees a phone, um, uh, a video camera in their face and suddenly just thinks, you know what, I'm going to take it easy and go home. No one does that. In the history of social media, in the history of public freakouts, has no one ever, when they've seen a phone in front of their face, right, someone recording them, gone, you know what, you brought that phone, I don't want to embarrass myself, my family, or my friends, I'm going to go home now. Never! They never do that. They just always switch, right? A switch just comes on and they want to fucking kick you. Or like that guy did with the lady um, in... Uh, that kind of what was that spinning roundhouse kick? He meant to kick. He said, oh, "I meant to kick. I meant to kick the phone." And he fucking kicks the girl in the head, and she's like, "Call the cops! Call the cops!" <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Actually, can I find this? This is fucking hilarious. It's honestly, one of the best videos ever. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Spinning kick. Uh, it's, it's, it's it, let's see spinning kick SJW. Uh, kick SJW. Let's see if that comes up. Oh yeah, first one. Boom, there we go. <laughs> Check this out. Oh god, so good. So good. That's right. What? They actually have people filming you all the time. It's classic. Kill the private property. Guess what? Hey, destruction of private property. Against the law. gets raped by somebody, and they're like, I'm a 16-year-old, and I can't have this baby. Think you should keep it? It's a baby. If someone was raped and she gave birth and she decided to kill her three year old child. Holy shit. Holy shit. Holy shit, man. Where did this, where did this purple wearing, um, purple American apparel wearing hoodie, um, male feminist guy think that he had the, what made, what possessed him to think he had the fucking dexterity, uh, the physical capabilities in order to roundhouse kick a mobile phone, a smartphone out of a woman's hand? Like, honestly, he really, he really overestimated his fucking talents <laughs> in terms of martial arts. Ah! Oh, he goes to kick the phone out of her hand. He also just kicks her on the side of the head, and she, of course, she falls to the floor. Um, and she immediately calls the cops. You know what I mean? It's like immediately. These people with their phone and in people's faces, they're going untagging again. It's a fucking stupid debate, you know. Planned Parenthood and all that malarkey and abortion policies, blah blah blah. They're all hot button topics that are immediately going to get people riled up anyway, regardless, right? You know that. But add that, add that to the fact that you go there with an opposing view, right? Yeah, you know what I mean. You're you're the dissenting voice in a in a in a in, you know in a mob, right? So you're obviously going to be the one that's going to be. You're obviously going there because you want to rile people up because you know you're the only one saying the opposite of what they're saying, and then you put the camera in their face. And it's sort of like she's half expecting some sort of physical violence because immediately when she hit the floor, call the cops, call the cops, call the cops. Do you know what I mean? She knew straight away. She's just fishing for physical violence. Like, so what you're saying is that if someone's 16 and they get raped, um, that they should um, have the right to not keep the baby? Huh? It's like, yeah, you know I mean, you expect someone to hit you. You expect someone to hit you straight away. And But that fucking kick is just obscene, absurd, bro. Imagine doing that, bro. Imagine, imagine thinking that's a good tactic in order to kind of win an argument. You know what? Fuck you. I hate what you're saying. Bang! <laughs> Kicking the side of the head. It's like, what are we doing? <laughs> can't we just sit, can't we just argue like adults and disagree to agree or call each other names and then just go home and punch our cats or something? Fucking hell! <laughs> oh man, no, honestly, I, I absolutely adore these people that go nuts in public like this. It just you know, not, nothing makes me more happy. And talking about being more happy at people going nuts in public, got a second one. <laughs> Um, what's this one that I pulled up here? Let's see here. If you like him or not, oh yeah, I love this. Oh, give me this argument. Oh 
Jesus Christ! <laughs> Honestly, these shows, who watches this shit? <laughs> I'm assuming it's like the Real Housewives or something, right? I don't know what the fuck is going on here. It's just the, the dead faces. I'm sure it's been cut. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure it's been edited well to make it look horrible. But the dead expressions on everyone's faces, right? Because they're having the most, you know, the most empty argument in the world. Essentially arguing about someone's right to have an opinion on the person that you're dating. And then the other person arguing, what, what do you know about who I should date? It's like, I don't. I'm just saying, I think they're not good for you. And then it just it spirals out of control until she drops an absolute bomb at the end. Fuck me, these shows. When you get what do you expect? When you get a group of middle-aged mums on TV, this is only going to end one way, right? It can't it can't be entertaining if it's wholesome, right? If you have to go, if, if they just concentrate on the struggles of being a, a middle-aged mum living in Hollywood and raising kids and trying to uh, restart your career in the industry where they fetishize youth, blah, blah, blah. That will be too boring. You have to have these fucking brain-dead arguments, right? You have to have these squabbles over the most minute things. You have to have this. Oh, it's just not entertaining, entertaining anymore. Who gives a shit if it's just mums arguing about, you know, what school to take their kid to? No one cares about that. You want to hear drama. You want to hear about the personal trainer that fucked both of that fucked two best friends, right? And how they've suddenly now dumped the other friend for the. Per- yeah, you want to hear that sort of stuff. But yeah, Jesus Christ, that was going to lighten the mood. Anyway, onto some topics of the day because that is what we're here for, and we're gonna get right on into it. White girls pretending they're black, aka Rachel Dolezal 2.0 slash black fishing now i'm sure some of you guys are not aware of this i'm gonna blow my nose actually oh god nice mucus always good mucus in the months of december for moi but yeah this is something i've learned of recently um and of course i think mucus as well is a coffee thing too right you get a lot of phlegm whenever i drink a lot of coffee i'm always very phlegmy and mucusy but anyway this is something i've learned recently about this black fishing i didn't know this is even a thing um i've watched the race dollars um documentary actually on netflix i don't know if you guys have watched it but okay i've got smooth now oh no is it coming oh jesus gonna make this make gonna make for a good screen grab anyway <laughs> um Rachel Dolezal documentary on Netflix is amazing. If you're not familiar with Rachel Dolezal, she was um very she went viral a couple of years ago um because um she was a former leader. She at the time she was a leader of the NC NCA double NC double AP or NCA double P whatever it is the National Committee for whatever black people and some shit um <laughs> black people and some shit whatever that committee was that is primarily for black people she was a leader of it and then um it got leaked or someone put it out there that she was actually white that she was actually you know tanning herself and making you know and putting um you know ethnic urban type hairstyles in order to kind of you know um look like she was black so this documentary on netflix kind of focusing on her story it's the kind of first time we'd kind of heard of this in public well the first time the public heard of this you know if you go if you grew up in the ends you've always known i've always you've always there's always been a girl in ends who whether they were asian white poor um, filipino uh, mexican wherever they may be and if they hang out in a predominantly black area they happen to take on they happen to adopt black mannerisms some black hairstyles and maybe had a bit of a taste or penchant for the black male or the black female regardless of their uh, depending on their gender or their sexual preference so it's something we've always known about if you're from ends but i think if you're joe schmo that went to regular degular school you don't necessarily see that you're like oh my god i can't believe that if you hang around in the area um surrounded by predominantly um you know a predominant race of people and they all happen to be your friends that like you might take on some of their mannerisms it's like you know standard shit but obviously Rachel dollars took it a step further you know by kind of darkening her skin color somewhat by being racially ambiguous quote unquote and also adopting this um framework or this line of thinking that said that you could identify as a particular color as a particular race at the moment we have the thing of like identifying as a particular gender right when people are identifying as um trans or when people identify yeah when people identify as trans or that whole movement right is that happens that people are kind of okay with accepting that in some sort in some way or in some in some way shape or form but identifying yourself as a race when the thing that delineates between race is physical attributes 
and you don't have any of the physical attributes, it can be a bit hard for people to swallow. So that kind of is, has, has evolved somewhat, and you kind of got yourself in a position now where you've got this these this girl um, that I saw, right? And I'm going to help you try and get up on here. That was um, uh, that has been accused of blackfishing, right? Uh, it's a Newsbeat article. And when you see her, right, you can't help but think, you know, this girl's in a bit of a wind-up. Um, hopefully, I can see if I can get a video up on here. Where is it? It's a Newsbeat video, right? Um, oh, There's a whole article on it talking about. But there's a video where she sort of talked. Yeah, so here, there's a video of her talking about. So, effectively, black fishing, the women accused of pretending to be black. So, this is an evolution of racial dollars. Though. It's fucking intriguing as hell. It's really, really interesting. It's something that I kind of... Have been wondering a lot about since watching the Rachel Dozo documentary because Rachel Dozo documentary um, is very illuminating because as much as the, as much as she's batshit crazy, there's also parts of her story that make sense of where she ended up where she was. Right? She grew, she kind of grew up in an abusive household according to her. Her parents kind of argue against it. Um, her parents adopted two black kids who she kind of took on. Um, who she kind of um, through the abuse relationship with her family she kind of took on a bit of a motherly role she got accepted more within the black community that made her feel welcomed so she had a bit of an identity identity crisis and the closest thing that she could kind of uh, identify to was the black community that kind of embraced her and she kind of took on and she kind of took it you know full full force right she kind of adopted everything about it and it suddenly rose herself up to the ranks of the nca double p and then she became i think the leader until she had to resign when the kind of the news uh broke but this story black fishing is an is a kind of evolution of this sort of thing right so uh, it's kind of you know plays on the term black um catfishing you know where girls and boys are for the most part you know pretend to be one person online in order to kind of lure in order to kind of seduce somebody and then you know when you know they usually fucking look like a bloody train when you meet them in real life but this is the evolution of it so that's very very interesting and i'm going to play this video from newsbeat that kind of speaks on 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 this topic and it's like with a girl called what's her name A aga aga bra aga brotokowska ada bro ada bros brotowska ada brotowska right cool so here's the video i'm going to play from bbc you have to listen to this now if you're listening via audio i've had no surgery so i can't take a few blips i can't i can't remove my fake bum plant like i can't change i can't i'm not gonna stop going gym till that i grow my size <laughs> Bruv, when's the last person you've seen that's Polish is Olive Skin, man? Shut the fuck up, man. This girl's lying. Olive Skin. What? <laughs> She'd get it though. She's fucking banging. God damn. So for example, braids, I would just probably be more cautious and with hairstyles and probably not get braids again just because it offended so many people. But with things like tanning, I'm, I don't feel like I've done... Imagine not getting braids because you're, you're afraid people might accuse you of putting on blackface. Jesus Christ, man. It's, it's a good place where we're in now, right? Where people are very um, culturally and... Um, culturally sensitive right i think it's a good place to be in because sometimes you know things that happened in the past won't necessarily happen nowadays right um a young a young prince harry thought it was a good idea to dress up in a nazi uniform during a fancy dress party because for the bands right but i don't think harry now would do the same thing i don't think he'd go to a, a fancy dress party 
um, dressed up trying to look like Michael Jordan, right? He wouldn't do that. He's a bit more culturally aware. He's a bit more woke, right? Um, I don't think Meghan Markle would allow him to step through, step out the door, you know, with a black face on. Do you know what I mean? And, and, uh, and a flipping bald hat or something like that. That wouldn't happen nowadays, but Jesus Christ. Imagine not allowing someone to have on braids because you think it's just, it's nuts. Anyway. Anything in a malicious way. Racism is still there. Uh, it's not right for people to use certain things from the culture in a malicious way to kind of get endorsements or whatever because it's not right. Colorism still exists. I'm not definitely not neglecting that. Um, I'm not standing and saying no, this doesn't happen, and a white privilege, is, white privilege is not a thing. I'm not here to say that. I was just kind of hoping to say that the assumptions you are making are wrong. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, this this is fucking interesting as fuck to me, right? Because again. I just think the wider world is kind of waking up to things that I think if you're from ends, you are aware of anyway. If you're from ends, you know for sure at least more than five people from ends that weren't black that were probably more black than you were. We've all had those friends in that area. I know I've had a few of them in my life growing up and they're still like that from to this day, right? Um, they, they grow up in a very hard environment, which you all have to grow up in. But they're at a bit of a disadvantage because they're not quote unquote sorry they're they're a bit disadvantaged because they're not black right so they kind of have to overcompensate and sometimes it can be for the better sometimes it can be for the worse right it can be they can be a bit cornier with it sometimes it can be for the better where they kind of work work their way up to be kind of lieutenants of gangs um, just because they're white and they had to kind of overcompensate how tough they were and end up beating up everybody in the area and everyone's like okay this guy is not only strong for a a white guy he's strong he's the strongest guy in the ends regardless right and then on the flip side you got girls in areas who grew up in areas where it was predominantly black right area or predominantly black culture area and just because you know that was the only options you had available in terms of your into dudes you only had to choose from the guys around, that are in in around your area and if they all happen to like a certain style of girl you had to play up to that you might then change when you go to college or university you might revert back to being you know sarah from next door but when you were in ends, you were fucking Sandra. Do you know what I mean? You had a bit of spice about you. You were a little bit, you know, you were a little bit feisty, whatever it may be called, or stush, whatever it may be called. Yeah, you, you had a little bit of attitude about you, right? You took off some, you took on some kind of mannerisms that you kind of learned um, from the environment that you were in. And it's something that we, we're, we're, we're very aware of. And there's also another part of this that no one wants to speak about, where it's like, this girl, Anja, she's, she's Polish, right? And she's saying she's olive skin, which I don't necessarily believe. I don't think I've ever seen an, a, an olive skin Polish person in my life. But then that being said, the only Polish people I've seen ever are the Poles that move, that kind of emigrate, um, that kind of immigrate um, from Poland to the UK. And they might be a, only a particular kind of, they might be only, they might be a, they, they, they obviously don't represent the whole entire population. Um, I know for sure that our landlord, um, yeah, our landlord is probably a good example. She's dark haired. She's not olive skinned, but you can tell she's Polish, but she's not, she's not like pale, right? Which is, I think, this is what this Anya girl is kind of like talking about. Like, she, she, I know she doesn't look, she doesn't look like Bill Burr, right? Um, she's not that pale, but I don't think all Polish people are that pale anyway. But it's just the other thing people don't want to talk about is that if you're built the way this girl is, right? She's saying she hasn't got any, any sort of um, she hasn't had any work done. I'm gonna put a picture up here again. She probably hasn't had any work done, and she kind of this is all natural. If you're built the way she is, there is something that needs to be said to that. How many? There's not that many white guys that are going to be into you, really, are there? Think about it, right? I, I have, I, you know, I've, I've, t I've talked quite candidly to a lot of my white male friends about this on, on, on a number of occasions, and they're just not into this kind of look. They might be into it nowadays, where it's kind of become a bit more trendy, but for the most part, white guys don't like girls that look like this. They want their girls to be a little bit more slim looking, right? So if you're built the way this girl's built. And you happen to live in a black neighborhood and only black guys are, are coming after you, then it's it makes complete sense that you're gonna kind of maybe um you're gonna exaggerate some of your features and you're going to maybe emphasize certain things in order to attract a certain kind of mate. And looking at her, right, I'm sure, I'm very, very, very sure that she likes rum. And when I mean rum, I mean black guys. I'm pretty certain that most of her ex boyfriends, if not all of them, have been black, right? So, if that's the case, can you be black fishing? If is that really black fishing, or is that just you playing into you playing up to people that are into you? 
I don't know, man, because whenever I see a very, whenever I see a, whenever I see a stereotypical Caucasian lady who's very curvy, like ridiculously curvy, right? And she happens to be the one in the group of girlfriends who's looking after the bags or on her phone. I get a little bit sad because obviously she's in the wrong environment. Because if you put her in a, if you pop, if you pop those group of girls in another nightclub, right? That happens to play bashment and hip hop. She'd be the one getting dragged all over the dance floor, right? People trying to pull her and say, hey, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? And her friends would be getting air on air on road. But in another pub, in like a bar, all bar one, for instance, her friend with the PlayStation bum is the one that everyone wants. So if you're that girl, what do you do? Do you, do you kind of accentuate your curves and play up to the kind of um, that archetype of a curvy woman that happens to be olive skinned and a little bit, you know, exotic? Or do you just, I don't know, I don't know. Or do you just like stay where, or do you just be who you are and hope some regular schmegler white dude's going to be into it, which he isn't really. Um, yeah, I don't know. And also there's that weird bubble of girls that exist, right? That kind of weird kind of um, race of girl. They're kind of an Instagram race, right? It's kind of a derivative of the Kardashian clan. They're not, they're not necessarily black. They're not necessarily Mediterranean. They're not necessarily... Um, Latino they're just this weird race in between where everyone's trying to be it's sort of like a beige it's like you know when you you know when you mix all the paint colors into one pot and it turns brown but instead of being muddy brown it's sort of like a beigey like it's like I don't know how to describe it. it's nothing it's like a it's like a race that doesn't exist we've it's a it's a new race we've, we've created so I don't I'm not even sure if she's even blackfishing she's just whatever Instagram race she is she's kind of accentuating that because Yes, yeah, she's attractive girl. Yes, yeah, she has a a great body, but you see that all the time. It's you're a bit. I'm a bit inoculized, but I don't get that era. It's not that exciting anymore to me, right? Just because you see it all the time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm above it. And if she wasn't available, I wouldn't fucking dive on like I was in a you know an Olympic size swimming pool. But I'm just saying that there is a there is a type of female that exists that kind of occupies that kind of zone, and you know they they tend to like black dudes. And they tend to be into black things. Like, I don't know what else is to say. it. Um, but I can understand if you're a black girl. These kind of girls do sometimes get a lot more uh, love than you would maybe. Um, maybe they take up, they take on some of the physical characteristics that a stereotypical black girl would have without necessarily the black girl attitude that some guys complain about. So you can sort of think that can be a bad thing. I know some work people kind of complain that, you know, these people like to take on some of the um, black characteristics, all the good parts, and they kind of push away all the bad, they kind of avoid all the bad parts, like getting stopped by police all the time, um, um, not being given the, not being given, um, not being uh, given, what's that thing called, when you're not being allowed to be innocent before trial, all that sort of shit. So some people can get annoyed by that, but I don't know, man, I don't know. She's playing up to her, She's playing, she's playing into it a little bit. She's kind of leaning into it. I'm not sure if she's, if you can find olive skin Polish people. I'm not sure if they exist. If they did exist, why she, she'd look, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's fucking bizarre to me. It's really bizarre. But I do maintain that there is another race of, there is a race that exists out there of Instagram girls that aren't necessarily black, that aren't Latino and aren't Mediterranean. I don't know what they are. They're just this weird thing that exists on social media. Usually they're, they're the kind of girl that has like loads of flags on their name, right? Um, under the name of like of the, all the countries of all the countries that somebody's from that's from their family's from. And it's not necessarily their lineage. It's not like their mum is half this, half that, and their dad's half that, half. It's usually just whatever. They pluck it from fucking thin air, or they take a twenty three and me test and just decide that they're I don't know forty percent uh, Brazilian. But yeah, it's just a strange place to be because I'm sure um, some people from ends remember a time. There was a time in ends right where it was fucking taboo to even mention that you were from africa that was like a you you were kind of uh, looked down upon if you admitted you were just like 100 percent african you had to always say you had a bit of spice in you like you had brazilian in you i remember those there'll be nigerian girls right this is this is back in 2001 i don't know when i don't I, nowadays maybe it's a bit different right but imagine a nigerian girl back in the day when i was in fucking year eight telling me that she's half brazilian like what the fuck are you talking about when would a nigerian meet a brazilian right especially nowadays especially then now, yeah, but back then, come on, man, fuck off. Like, I'm 50% Brazilian. No, you're not. You're not Brazilian at all. You probably don't even know where Brazil is on the map. Brazilian. Fuck out of here, man. 
Like it was fucking nuts. Like no one wanted to say they were African. Everyone kind of even the Car- even Caribbeans had a bit of a you know whatever. You had to kind of inject a bit of you know Dominican Republic in you, you know, kind of jazz up a bit. Fucking crazy to see how far we progress. This is awesome. I think it's it's probably been it's probably been um the co- as a consequence of of, of Afro Afro pop and Afro beats and Afro house, right? Afro house from southern africa from like south, south africa and angola and then afro pop afro beats from like western africa and uh, west africa yeah for the most part i think that's what's really made that kind of that kind of um thing going pop and going global that's kind of allowed african people to be a little bit more proud of where they're from and take a little bit more pride in their culture and not try and pretend that they're fucking caribbean or whatever or south american which is always annoying but jesus imagine now we're living in a world now where polish girls want to be black that's insane insane in fucking saying you never really imagine you never rocking that. and again i don't think it's a black thing i think it's an instagram culture thing whatever that instagram culture thing is that exists right you know those kids that do those fucking dances and all that sort of shit it's something it's that it's not even a it's not even black it's something else because black is like you know drill right that's what i think of that and it's not that hard it's not that aggressive it's like another version of it it's like a little bit more uh sanitized right it's a little bit more pg friendly for instance um but yeah, I just I don't know, man. I just think if you're if you're a, if you're a standard Polish girl and you happen to have a ridiculous figure, it's gonna be tough for you to find another white dude that's gonna be into that sort of stuff. I just don't I just don't I just don't think they're into it. I just think they like their girls a bit flat, which is not a bad thing. I'm just like this girls a bit skinny, right? I think even big girls, even even girls that aren't curvy, girls that are just fat, suffer a lot in white. Who's that girl? Um, Gemma Collins, whatever. I, I'm not. I'm sure. I I don't know. She seems like a nice girl, but I don't think there's many guys beating down her door white or black right like she's just a big girl you just you know it's just hard to find a mate but it's harder to find a mate within a culture that doesn't really um fetishize over bigger ladies but you know i think black people you know by and large you know you go to any go to any bashment night and for the most part the ones that are getting absolutely slammed against the wall and chucked up into the into the air five feet high are the big girls for the most part some tiny girls get flinged about from time to time but for the most part everyone loves to fucking run and jump onto a massive girl right um Massive, you know, all due respects, you know. No, I'm not I'm not taking a piss out of the bigger girls because I think everyone needs and appreciates some sort of loving, but fucking hell. What world we live in, man? Black fishing. Imagine that. Black fishing. So yeah, big up Anya Batakowski. Big up her for not changing her name. She she did the whole like, you know, tanning herself and giving herself braids, making herself look like she's I don't know, Puerto Rican. But she didn't um she didn't change her name, which is you know, respect to you, man. Respect. Kept the name. I mean, Poland strong, you know what I mean? Stand up tisky in that <laughs> um, what else is here the 50 places to work via um the 50 best places to work um courtesy of Glassdoor. oh this is an interesting little survey i saw so where would you think the most interesting or the best place to be work would be in the uk right because workplaces nowadays especially it's weird because in the scene i'm only gonna speak to it from scene wise right because growing up or coming up from the scene, I think I always had a little bit of a disdain for people that work, you know, sceney jobs, whether they worked at Nike or Adidas or whatever big publication. Because for the most part, they were just fucking, you know, they didn't do anything creative themselves. They weren't putting out anything themselves. They just had a cool job. But they wore that, they wore it as like a badge of honor, right? Oh, I've got this cool job in this place. But you don't do jack shit. You didn't make the company. You didn't start it. You're not, you haven't, you don't have your own brand. You don't run your own club night. You're not making your own radio show. I mean, you're just a guy that works in a magazine, right? That talks about other people. Like, fuck you, right? So I never had that much respect for it. But there is also a little bit of, um, they were put on the pedestal, those jobs, right? People thought they were just like, you know, the pinnacle of all pinnacles. And you had to be involved in your scene day in, day out in order to kind of be informed about it and it was in order to kind of be around and to be about, right? But I never really agreed with that. I, I've always, I was always sort of thinking that if you had to work, I'd much prefer just to have a good, pay, a well, a high paying job, right? Somewhere in an industry that had nothing to do with uh, streetwear, fashion, uh, cultural stuff, just something away from it. Um, where it allowed you to make good money and then you could you know tap into you could then go and tap into or plug into scene stuff whenever you wanted to you could go to the odd thursday um gallery um private view you could go to a reading um you could go to a stone launch whatever you could do your things without needing to be involved in the industry without working there because again like i said or like like i in my opinion i just think there's too many of us in, interested in the same thing in the same sort of scene and there's not enough jobs to go around so you're essentially we're crabs in the crabs in the bucket right we're fighting over scraps 
Um, and for the most part, the jobs that everyone wants and are really top, those old fogies aren't going anywhere, right? They're going to hang on to their jobs for dear fucking life, right? You have these adult sneakerheads, right? Name no names. We're working at companies who are just there again. I mean, just constantly buying shit, constantly around, constantly taking up space. You know what I mean? Constantly just... Again, it's not... I don't, I don't agree with, the, you know, stepping away and make room for the new generation. I think that's fucking bullshit. I think we should be kicking the kicking those fucking guys out. But if you are... If you are hoping that they would step aside, that isn't going to happen. So what you should be doing if you're a young person or if you're someone coming up in the scene is that you should be trying to make your money outside of the scene and then you should be making all that money, all that money that you're making outside the scene you should be plugging it or pushing it back into your creative projects that are going to feed back into the scene and make this thing last forever and ever and ever. It's a cycle, right? We're going to, we need to sustain it. That's what the, our forefathers or our, our kind of OGs did before us and we kind of need to carry that forward kind of going forward. You know, they passed the baton to us, we kind of need to keep doing that. But it necessarily mean that you have to always be involved in the scene i don't necessarily agree that you could work in an agency designing fucking labels for washing up liquid right and make bank it's gonna be brain dead you're gonna be um you're gonna want to shoot yourself in the face numerous times it's gonna be corporate as fuck right but you're gonna earn good money right and you're gonna be able to take that money and that's gonna be able to fund your label it's gonna be able to fund your fucking passion project whatever you're gonna be doing and you can kind of feed that back into the scene so with that being said it's with it's with great pleasure that this list that i've seen on glassdoor that ranks the 50th best places to work in the uk doesn't contain any cool brands no cool brands no cool brand whatsoever brands you probably haven't companies you probably haven't even heard of right and i'll le read them out i'll put them up on the screen for, for, you to, for those of you watching on youtube but yeah it's good to see that there's no cool no cool brands on here everything is just companies that have great uh company cultures and everyone likes to work there and then obviously make good money so number one is angelian angel and angelian angelian water How, why can't i pronounce that that's such an easy word to pronounce angelian Angelian Water on Glassdoor, right? Workforce is clearly proud, passionate, and really cares about what they do, which results in a really positive culture and working environment, someone says. Number two is Bain and Company. Number three, Expo Logistics. Expo Logistics. Number three, Bromford. Uh, number five, Salesforce, which some of you might have heard of. Number six, Sky Betting and Gambling. Some people might have heard of too. Number seven, Hisco. Number eight, SAP. Number nine, Taylor and Wimpley. And number 10, Royal London. Imagine those. None, no cool companies. Maybe for the exception of Salesforce, who are a startup, but for the most part, you know, SaaS project, uh, B2B, it's not the most cool thing. You're not going to hear someone at Dragon Bar telling you that they work as a marketing executive at Salesforce, and you're going to be like, oh, wow, it's amazing, right? It's not uh, Widen Kennedy or whatever. But that's amazing to see, right? No Widen Kennedy's on there, no fucking Converse, Nike, sneakers and stuff, Foot Patrol, Supreme, all that bullshit. Just great company culture, just great companies that exist, that have been existing for years and years and years, that have great company culture and pay their employees well. That's what's needed. And I think people need, to, people need to look at these things more often because I think there's so much talent, there's so much ability, there's so much um, know-how and knowledge um, that exists within the scene that sometimes I think it gets wasted when these kids are DMing um, people within the industry who they think are smashing it and asking them to intern for them or do this or do that. I think you're doing yourself a disservice because for the most part, those guys don't know anything more than you know, right? But what they do, what they have figured out is that if you try to do stuff, if you put yourself out there and you put your money where your mouth is, that sometimes opportunities might come, more opportunities will come towards you, right? You might end up uh, in a position that you didn't necessarily intend to be in, right? A good example is that Heron Preston, right? I'm, not, I'm pretty sure he didn't seek out to be, a uh, runway fashion a uh, ready to wear fashion designer right but by consistently putting out projects consistently being around consistently putting his money where his mouth is uh backing himself um he's now found himself in a position where he's got a very successful label he's got a very successful um sub label with that thing basketball skateboards he just opened his first store in hong kong he's actually smashing it right with his own thing he's got a nike collaboration with the glasses that came out the other day but it's it's not because he knows more than we know it's just because that he's been he's been brave enough. He's taken the bravest step that most people don't do, and he's put work out. He has shit product. He doesn't sat there pontificated. He hasn't put up Pete because I even some people do on, on my on my social do a lot. He hasn't. He, he's not sharing line sheets or PSD files or things that he could have should have done. No, he makes physical product and he ships it. Right. That's so 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 crucial. But I think sometimes people can. Um, over put too, put that stuff too much on the pedestal too because it's easy to do but also people can filter something sometimes think 
the shortcut way to get around to doing that is to intern for these people, to intern for a Virgil, to intern for a Heron, to intern for wherever it may be or a Kanye. But I think the best thing to do is to work somewhere in an industry that has nothing to do with streetwear, learn an actual skill, learn an actual trade that if the streetwear or the scene dream dies and it doesn't materialize, you can go back to making actual good money. Because sometimes these people that work these fucking flaky jobs in, scene, in the scene industry, if that thing implodes, you've got no job to go to, really, in general, because you haven't actually learned anything. You have to go right back to the bottom and entry-level job. That's why some, for the most part, people that work scene stuff are still working retail, still working bar jobs, because you don't necessarily have a, um, um, a real job on your CV. I think what you should be doing is trying to make make your, have a career outside of the of your area of interest and then whatever money that you make outside the area of interest pump it back into the area of interest that you're into so you can participate and take part and have something to show for it and i just i don't know i think that's better i think i'd much rather if i had if you have more disposable income you should be using that disposable income to kind of further your dreams but i just think sometimes it can be a bit difficult when you're working in an industry that you're already passionate about and you earn shit money you can sometimes think that you've already you're already doing the work because you're just there. You're at a party. It's sort of like um I remember there was a um, study that said that uh, I think it's like fifty to sixty percent of marathon runners uh, don't actually turn up to the race, which is a fucking weird stat or weird whatever percentage it was. But the reason that happened was because a lot of these races, especially like the London Marathon, they're over oversubscribed. They're hard to get into. So when people win a spot to get into the race. Um, they will um, London Marathon or Virgin will send you an email with the kind of like congratulations you've won your place kind of like you know for you to share on social media but sometimes people already get the dopamine hits from sharing that on social media all the likes oh my god congratulations well done I'm so proud of you that it, already, it feels like their brain tells it's like their brain tricks you your brain tricks you and convinces you that you've already run the race you've done it already you don't need to actually turn up to the race itself and it kind of takes away the um, motivation or the enthusiasm for the race coming up so sometimes it can be the same thing for working in the scene if you're working in the scene and you're interning and you're making 700 pound a month but you're around everything you get to see these these um iconic people in the industry day in day out they know your name you email them back and forth you get free some free products here and there it can you can it can, you can you can get the uh, the illusion or the assumption that you're actually involved and you're taking part when well, you're not really you're just like um you're just like a well compensated you're just like a well cons compensated uh fan right but you're not necessarily um are participating in a culture which is something that's a bit weird again if you don't want to participate that's fine i think those jobs are quite beneficial but i still think it's better that you make a career outside of scene and then if a sales uh, if a sales director role comes up at stussy you're going to be the best possible candidate because you've actually you, you know you've been the sales director at fucking iceland right you've actually worked the, you actually know what that job entails you're not just going you know you're, you're, you're not just doing it with like a startup mindset you're gonna figure it out along the way and buy a couple of books no you've actually worked at this job for years and you worked your way up and people can actually trust you so i think that's really um crucial and i think yeah this this survey is very um interesting to read because I, I think if you've been to any sort of interview and you've read glass door reviews prior to going to interviews you'll know that glass door reviews can be fucking brutal for the most part people that are you know there, there is a section of people that leave reviews on glass door who are kind of disgruntled employees there's also a push of people who are you know sometimes losers because you know people that leave comments or reviews on places online anyway you know what I mean? it's a certain type of person for the most part but it can be quite brutal, right? For a company to put to put themselves out there on the glass door, you kind of, you know, you get the bare honest truth because people can post anonymously. So for some of these places to get four out of five stars to be rated amongst the best places to work on glass door definitely shows you that they're the best places to work because it's a tough, tough crowd on there. So yeah, I recommend you check it out. I'll link it in the show notes for anyone else that's interested to check it out. But yeah, top 10, no cool companies, all companies you haven't heard of until you get to like maybe the, the second half of the list, you might be some more familiar companies like Microsoft, uh, Google, Ikea, uh, uh, Nando's, which is uh, I didn't think would be a one, um, which and uh, the quote here on the Nando's is like um, they're 19 on the list. It says um, really cares about your personal growth and development, superb progression opportunity, which is fucking awesome to hear, right? You think you, you wouldn't think that looking at Nando's, but I guess you know be, behind the curtain 
they do a good job at making sure the ones that do want to get promotions, the ones that do want to take on more responsibility, get given the opportunity. Because sometimes, you know, working in those kind of service industry jobs, it's not it's no fault of the company really, but it does happen quite often that they don't necessarily um, give you the opportunity to progress through the ranks, especially if you're doing a good job at the store, at that location. The um, managers can be a little bit greedy and want to keep you there because, you know, it's very hard to find good people that work service jobs trust. Like, I think even as a customer, you'll know this. You know, I went into a shop the other day and was went to buy a fucking clothing rack and asked the guy hey do you have any clothing racks he's like i was like excuse me and he was just he was just doing his thing and he was he didn't look up once and i was like and, he, and I, I, put, I stopped so he would look up because you know i wasn't making a noise with my fucking mouth and he looked up fine i was like come on man like you know one lesson one of fucking working a service job or working retail is fucking make eye contact with the person you're talking to he wasn't making any eye contact whatsoever just like you know doing his own thing so it's very difficult to find people that and again that's not a teachable thing that's not that's something that you just know you should just know it as a human being that you should look at someone you're speaking to if i have to teach you that then that's you know we're already losing right you're already on the on the losing side but um I, so I, sometimes I have a bit of sympathy for managers that don't want their that intentionally stop people from progressing up the ranks because if you're good uh, and you're a good sales assistant sometimes allowing you to progress up the managerial ranks you're gonna you know you're, you're gonna be a, become ambitious and you're gonna want to join the new store that opened down the road and then i'm gonna lose you and then i'm gonna have to try and replace you and it's not gonna happen right like i'm gonna have to find three people that can do one the one three people might just might be able to do the job that you did sometimes so if when someone's really good they want to hold on to them. but sometimes there are those stores that do exist like dr martin's when i was there that do a really good job that of uh, progressing people up uh, up the ladder if you want that if you want that for the most part and you make it known then they'll do any, everything in their power to make sure that you kind of get the position so that's something that i've always been cautious of but yeah i recommend you check it out it's a good little list it speaks a lot on the things that i've spoken about in the past and i think it's very 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 important Anyway, that's an hour, an hour 10 actually so far. Thank you for tuning in. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm now going to, for you guys listening on the audio, you'll hear um, half of a techno mix I put together the other day. Um, you can listen to the rest of it in the link that I chat below. For you listening, for you watching on YouTube, you'll be able to li listen to the whole entire mix by clicking the link below. And I will guess I'll see the rest of you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the Excellent Zinger Show. But thanks all for tuning in. As always, check out my website, excellentzinger.com for more information about what I'm up to. Um, um, again i'm djing this friday and all fridays of december and all fridays of this month at tap east so at tapped so you can check that out as well under my dj gigs tab on my website to find all the information where i'm djing all those kind of things and all links to my socials but yeah i'll see you guys again very very soon on the other side for another episode of the Zinger show thanks so much for tuning in it's been a fucking pleasure an absolute fucking pleasure and i'll see you guys again very soon for you guys listening to an audio podcast enjoy this techno mix that i put together i spent a lot of time researching and gathering these songs over a period of a couple of days so i hope you enjoy it for those of you watching on youtube click the link below this is some techno have a little dance and i'll see you guys again very soon peace